rewriting of history in terms of our folk, uh, there has been a serious crime that has been perpetrated. And men like Dr. Ivan Van Sertima have come to pull the covers off the criminals and to bring the truth to those of us that have been duped and swindled and made to believe that we were nothing, but he's come to let us know that we are something and that, that the history that we have that is, is one of, that is long and deep and fruitful. And so I think that you're going to be pleased in what he has to say this evening. I know that when you walk out of here, you'll walk out of here fed and satisfied with what you've heard. So it is with great pleasure and pride that I present to you Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Let me begin this evening by saying that this is part of a series. It is very important to realize that Africa is an exploded star, a shattered diamond, and that its pieces have to be followed on, in all the continents. You cannot have a sense of what was essentially African just by going into Africa. You have to look into Europe, into Asia, into America. I have been associated for a long time with the American thesis, the establishment of an African presence in early America. But that is just a, a part, it's just one part of the whole story. What we are trying to achieve is a synthesis of the African presence all over the world. The African presence in Europe, which I'm dealing with tonight, is tremendously important, just as important as the African presence in early America because it really begins at the very beginning. Because there are no Europeans on this planet until about 55 to 50,000 years ago, whereas there are Africans going back three million years. Now, in, in February of this year, I sat on a panel with Alex Haley and Donald Johansson. Johansson is the man who discovered the first human being on Earth. You have all heard of Lucy. Lucy goes back three and a half million years. But Lucy, found in Ethiopia, is not really a complete human being. It's what is known as a hominid, but it does not have the brain size of modern man. Okay, so the mere fact that man was born in Africa is in itself not important. I want you to note that what we have discovered over the last five years is far more important we have not simply discovered that man was born in Africa. What has been discovered recently is that the last man was born in Africa and that all human beings now on this earth are anatomically African. In other words, the brain and organism that we all occupy is African, whatever the skin color, etc. This is something that is really very recent because it was argued when I was going to university even though it was accepted that man was born in Africa, the argument went, man was born in Africa and man then moved out into Europe and Asia and developed into proper man, complete man. Okay, and those benighted half human types that remain in Africa, they remained at the low level, are not far removed from the low level at which they entered Europe and Asia, and then the bright ones, the complete ones, the proper ones, they then went back to Africa and gave them scraps of their civilization. This is really seriously believed. Make no mistake about it. And for, for the discoveries of the last few years that have made an impact with, is only possible because of the fact that it is coming from the very best universities. One of them, Oxford, which is an extremely conservative university, is the first to come out to announce after study of mitochondrial DNA, the first to announce that there is no doubt that the founding population of the modern world was African. That is very important because man being born in Africa is not the same thing. Because man could have been born in Africa and it was argued he went out into Europe at a low level stage, which he did, Homo erectus, not a proper complete man, and then came Neanderthal man and then came Grimaldi man. But what they find is that all of these stages of man are African. Every one. Africa is the only place 
that has the complete sequence of all the stages of man. So it is not only the first incomplete or extremely primitive low-level brain man that is born there, but the highest form of man, modern man, was born there. So you see all the stages, the first three stages died out, the last three stages moved into Europe, Asia, and the rest of Africa, and then they died out until eventually Africa produced the complete man, which is the man we have today, modern man. They find that man in Africa about 100 to 140,000 years ago. So even though Lucy, we found Lucy three and a half million years ago, Lucy is not modern man. Okay, modern man only goes back about 140,000. Some people put it at 200,000. What has also been established by Rebecca Kahn is that all the creatures now on this planet can be traced to one black woman who lived about 150,000 years ago. They have been able to do this with great precision because the, the, the instruments we have now, the way we can go into the blood and find out the history of man, we know that only the black has all the genes. So they're, and they can find out at what point you have these variations and mutations. Now, how did it happen in the sense that how did the Europeans happen? How did they come into being? The African, as I say, occupied Europe. There are no Europeans in Europe about 50 to 55,000 years ago. The African peoples the whole world. However, the final man, Grimaldi man, um, is caught in Europe, he's caught in a certain ice circle. There's a period known as the worm interstadial, and he's caught in the ice. There are parts of Europe that are covered by ice half a mile thick. The African in that area, wherever he produces the albino, and the African produces pink people. Even without mixtures, the Africa produces a pink type occasionally. That pink type is usually a type that dies easily because if you produce an albino in Africa he would suffer from devastating skin cancers. However, the albino that the African produced in Europe became a selected type because in the darkness of Europe, the twilight of Europe, the ice of Europe, where you did not have the direct and intense sunlight, the albino or albino type um, began to be began to survive and to be selected so that after a while you find a number of pink skin Africans with African morphology that is the, the nose mouth the jaw remaining the same but only the skin changing and of course whenever there is um, skin color change pigmentation change you also have eye color change hair color change that change um, was necessary in some places because the ice made it impossible, the situation in ice Europe, not present Europe, not temperate zones, but the ice situation created a serious problem. It created a serious problem because pigmentation does not allow for all the light in twilight zones to come into the skin. Now sometimes this could be um, the vitamin D deficiency that may result can be um, remedied by fishing. Like you find in certain zones where there's a lot of fish, you may still find fairly dark types like the Eskimo. Of course, there are other reasons for the Eskimo still retaining, in many cases, a dark color even though he's in the ice. But you find these changes going on. And then you find in Asia, as the African moves into Asia, you find in some parts the epicantic fold, the fold coming across the eye, like in the Japanese, some of the Chinese, etc. Because this becomes necessary as you move against certain kinds of winds on the steps. So man's morphology, that is, man's superficial face, has nothing to do with his brain or his internal organism. That is just a cover. In other words, man's cover varies, but man's internality man's internal organism, his brain, does not vary. And that internal organism, that brain, and that thing that is covered by the skin is African, because all the stages were African. 
Now, some people have argued, and there's a new school, for example, that argues that the Europeans suffered irreparable and permanent damage as a result of that mutation. I do not subscribe to such theories because I believe that what has been established in the last few years is the hard scientific ground for the equality of man. However, it is the Europeans' fault or the fault of Eurocentrics that that kind of theory is now emerging because Eurocentrics tried for centuries to convince us, black people, that we were the inferiors. And I remember as a boy, and I have said this several times when I was 14 years old and somebody called me a Negro, and that I had never heard before because I had read the Greek and Roman classics but, and I had not seen the word Negro. So I went to check it out to see exactly where I stood. And I saw in the Encyclopedia Britannica in Georgetown, Guyana, that the Negro is the last person to appear on the earth. He's only 10,000 years old. So we are the young, unformed people. And then they said that uh, the Negro is incapable of adult intellectual development. The cranial sutures of his brain close down at an early age, arresting further development. Now, I did not know that was written by South Africans. After all, it's quite natural because most of the work done in archaeology was being done in Africa, and since it was being done by whites, it would be done by white Africans, which are mostly the South Africans. Then they tried to show that the brain of the Negro, the so-called Negro, is smaller than the European brain. And then, then that after a while, they discovered that the biggest brain in the world is the brain of the South African Bushman. Well, that was abandoned. <laughs> then there was an attempt to show that it is not the size of the brain, it's the convolutions in the brain, markings that come from the highly sophistication, the highly sophisticated activities of man. So there was an attempt to deal with that. And then we found that that was not valid because, as Sheikh Antony Diop showed, they were making selections. They would take the brains that they could play with, the brains of diseased Africans or Africans in prison, etc., and compare them with highly intellectual European types. As Diop said, if you were to compare my brain, then you would have a problem. Now, all of that has gone on the the carpet. People no longer argue like that. But yet I was very surprised. I was invited by the Archaeological Society of America. I will not tell you that it has many branches. And to save certain reputations, I shall not men mention which branch invited me. But nevertheless, they invited me to dinner. And while we were at dinner, we were talking. And of course, they were trying to draw me out to see where I stood, whether I was dangerous to offer a speech to their society and so forth, and or at least trying to make me tame by giving me um, their food, um, not realizing that when I'm well fed, I speak better. <laughs> and um, when we were at table, this uh, magazine had just come out, you know, with the jerry curls, Adam and Eve, etc., and their jerry curls and their bronze skins. And uh, this, leading, this very famous anthropologist said, when I pointed out that uh, at least there is some kind of admission, but it doesn't go far enough, and he says, no, 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 hold on a minute. Don't let us go with the fashion. It hasn't been proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that man was born in Africa, that the last man was born in Africa. There's still a possibility that he was born in Asia. And I put down my knife and fork, and I said, it's amazing to me that after all the work that has been done, we've gone through that for more than a generation, that we can still talk about man being born in Asia. Because everything shows that that is not so. You do not have that range of fossils, and you do not have the ages of fossils, and you do not have the stages of man in Asia. He got very upset, and he was... You could see from the way he was moving his hands that he regretted that I was sitting at this table, but it was too late. <laughs> and I got up there that night and I gave a speech, and uh, they were rather disturbed. They thought I would keep quietly to dealing with the little breakthroughs Africans made in their own continent. They didn't think that I would deal with Europe and show the profound 
influence of Africa and Europe because they want to keep that very pure. That is what this whole story is about. We have become the invisible man of history. Everybody else is visible and significant. We do not exist. We, we move like fleeting shadows over the continent of the world and we seem to have left no mark. We are the only people who seem to have just moved through and left no mark. How could that be possible? We who fathered it all. And I'm not saying we fathered all the sciences. That, that, that is a hollow boast. But we who fathered man. How could we have passed over the whole world for all those many, many centuries and generations without having left a mark? How well, how well has this been hidden? Because apart from the question of Grimaldi man given to Cro-Magnon man, the so-called Caucasoid type, a culture that, that Europe did not have, at the very beginning the, 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 the tools and, and weapons, even some early musical instruments were left in Europe, art too, a certain kind of art where you could look on the caves of Europe at a certain period and find that the women are identical with the women in southern Africa because Europeans had not yet appeared. I mean, the, what we call the European today. But let us look at civilization now. Let us look closely at the record of the impact of Africa and its presences in Europe. Now, physical presences in itself is not enough. I, and you can see quite clearly where that could lead. We have a, a remarkable historian, black historian, Snowden, Frank Snowden. I had a real running with him on television. I have quieted him for a while because um, he comes out with this television program in which he says that there are no blacks of any dominance in Egypt. Egyptians are not black. They're not of the black variety. There are no uh, figures of any dominance until you get to the 25th dynasty. The old story. Now here is a man. Now look closely to show you that gathering facts together, however meticulous you are, is not enough. Without a certain critical appraisal and without a certain understanding of what has happened in the world, what Europe has done to Africans and the people of African descent. You can be totally misled, especially if you're a coward. Because all Snowden has done, remarkable though his work is, meticulous though it is, is to show that we have been there. We were in Europe. And they have these nice pictures showing you how some of the Europeans thought we were cute. The hell with being cute! What did we do? And he never shows us doing anything but being servants and being um, objects of beauty perhaps for art. But when it came to real significant contributions, no. It's just a physical presence. I am not merely interested in a physical presence, but a cultural presence. What did we do? What impact did we have in Europe? Merely being there doesn't make us anything. What impact did we have? We had a profound, a profound impact. When the Europeans first attacked Africa, and I'm not talking about the latest slave trade period, when the great Europeans, which were then the Greeks, who came much later, who got their thing together much later than the Egyptians, when they walked into Africa and walked into Egypt, they were absolutely stunned. Egypt is not something that you could say, oh, but it happened in Egypt, like some isolate. It wasn't an isolate. Egypt was the flower of Africa. There were all sorts of strands and threads moving, moving over many, many centuries. We have found some of the hieroglyphs now in West Africa. We have found ritual practices among the Yoruba and the Dogon, which are Egyptian. Not because the Egyptians brought it, but because it was there before it went up to the Egyptians. In other words, Egypt was a child of Africa. It's not the father, it was the child. That is why the word Africa actually comes from afro Ica, an Egyptian word that means birthplace. They look back to the south. Even the word for south, Kenti, 
It doesn't just mean the south, it means the first. It means the beginning also. They look back to Africa, back to the heartland, the continental heartland, as the source of their ritual, the source of their concepts of religion, the source of their techno complex or science, the source of their main ideas. And what we found in 1962 is very important. We found a pharaonic dynasty. First in Nubia, which is undis indisputably African, it is first found there in the dawn, not in the evening, in the dawn. And as Bruce Williams has shown, who was one of the discoverers, you have this pharaonic impulse running through the Nubians even at times when they are oppressed by their brothers and cousins, and that's not unusual. You don't think that because one people oppress another, they are of different races. That You see that in Vietnam. There was wars between the North and South. It's the same people. You see that in even in America, the, the, the civil war between the North and the South. It's the same people fighting. So that you're not to assume that because there were wars between Egypt and Nubia, or there are periods in which Egypt suppress Nubia, that they're different people. That has nothing to do with race. All the arguments, when you look at the plant life of the Egyptians, the bottle gourd, cultivated cotton, the tamarind, the oil palm fruit, a range of things, you could trace a whole lot of things. All the plant life is African, it is Sudanic. Now, if, if Egypt had been created by Asiatics, or Europeans, where are their plants? In that early period, where are their plants? The language which was in question for so long has been established by Diop through thousands of interconnections to be an African language. The iconography, you go back to those early kings, the Narma, the first king of Egypt. You go back to people in the 11th and 12th dynasties. You go back to the people in the first Great kingdoms, the faces are clearly African, not like the people in Egypt today. Those are not Egyptians. Okay, you have to make those distinctions. There are some Africans in Egypt, but Arab is not an African. There are some Arabs who are African because Arab is not a race. But the Arab Republic of Egypt is not an African Republic. Make that quite clear because the, when, when Diop was fighting in UNESCO, the people who, who, who hurt him most and who objected most to being called black were the Egyptians because they had nothing to do with it. The Arabs came into Egypt in 638 AD. That is thousands of years after Egyptian civilization. They had nothing to do with it. That, that Arab, the Arabian type that is, had nothing to do with establishing Egyptian civilization. It's just like America. There are no Native Americans in this room. And if you go into other white institutions, there are no Native Americans. There are modern people who have migrated to this country, whether by forces most of us have, or by, um, by invading the country. Likewise in Egypt, its culture has been changed. It's speaking another language. When you go and you look at those incredible monuments, they have nothing to do with the people walking around there. They don't even know what it means. They don't even know how to deal with it. We, my wife and I were in Egypt this summer. And we were photographing the wigs because we discovered that the two major clues to establish the blackness of the early Egyptians is skin and hair. Skin, lucky, because they were the only people who preserved their skin. Europeans didn't. They didn't know how. Africans preserved bodies for thousands of years. We have a picture of an African princess, 3,000 years old. Her skin looks like if she was buried yesterday. The hair, the eye, the pupil of the eyes, the skin, the teeth. Can you imagine that? Some people lose their teeth by the time they're dead. She, she has her teeth 3,000 years later. 
You're not dealing with ordinary people. This was the period in the world when blacks had a chance to sit down and do some thinking. They had overpowered certain territories and they could control their destiny. They were not slaves of anyone. And they had a chance to do their science. And it's not an accident that we're far ahead of the rest of the world in astronomy, in mathematics, in mummification, in brain surgery, in a range of medical things. It's not miracles. They were involved in their science for a long time while other people were struggling. The European had not caught up with that. So that when the first European entered Africa and touched Egypt when the Greek touched the Egyptian, they did not treat them with contempt. I want you to note that it's not automatic about white and black being enemies. The whites were stunned by the achievements of the blacks. And they were not only stunned, they stood in awe so that even though they had defeated the armies which had been taxed by battles with the Asiatics and battles with all sorts of people, the Persians and so forth, when they came in and they overpowered them, they bowed down before their gods. They took the black man in Hotep and worshipped him as a god. Many black women were, became goddesses for the whites. Isis, who was the goddess, who was the female representation of God. She was worshipped throughout Europe, a black woman. They didn't think any woman of their race had that nobility. Artemis became the goddess of chastity. Minerva became the goddess of wisdom. These are black women. Circe in the Odyssey, a black woman. Andromeda, who helped Jason win the Golden Fleece, who married Perseus, the great Greek hero. That's a black woman. It's whitewashed afterwards on the vases, but you could see in the black women in the antiquity book, you could see what it looked like originally. And Isis became the prototype of all the great Madonnas of Europe. And even when they were broken, some of them were remade with European faces, but with the black ritual color. So it went right through. Everything was affected. They couldn't understand how the Egyptians had written such advanced medical texts. You know, the Egyptians were already, had already done a, a, a major work on the pulse. You know, the Greeks, the Europeans, only came to terms with, with that advance in the pulse a thousand years later. Egyptians had books, diagnostic percussion, studies of circulation, studies of the pulse. They had chapters that were taken by the Europeans, the Greeks, and copied word for word. Hippocrates, the so-called father of medicine, the Greek, copied studies and fractures of the clavicle and dislocation of the mandible copied word for word. The medical school of Kos in Europe, in Greece, was an imitation of the medical schools in Egypt. Every scholar, St. Clement of Alexandria, said that if you were to write a book of a thousand pages, it would not be enough to put the names of Greek scholars who went to study in Africa. That was the big thing as today in shattered Africa, Africans have to go to Europe to study in those days. Europeans flocked to Africa to study because there was nothing much to study in Europe. Their astronomy was transformed by the Africans. They did not know how to shape the year. They had primitive, inadequate calendars. Egypt gave us the world's first accurate calendar, the 365 and a quarter day year. But of course they observed the quarter differently. They observed it at the end of 1,460 years. They had a leap year. We no longer have a leap year. We call it a leap year, but we don't have it. They did. We only have a leap day. And they had, they split the year after they dealt with the quarter that way. They were left with 365 days. They had five festival days. They created Christmas, not Europe. It's Africa created Christmas. Egypt, the word Christ is an African word, K-R-S-T, Christ or Christ. Then it was translated into Greek, Christos. It's not European. 
The Europeans did not embrace Christ. That was to come much later. When Jesus was being crucified, it's white soldiers, Romans, who were putting the spear in him, who was, who was putting him up on the cross because the Jews thought he should die because he had outraged the Jewish high priest by doing things and saying things that they found ridiculous. Moses had told them, an eye for an eye, a tooth for two. Jesus said, you not, only, not only should you forgive your brother seven times, but seventy times seven. Jesus had the audacity to pick up a whip and chase people out of the temple, which they considered to be a violent act. There were many things that led to that man being killed because he carried ideas, many of which you can find among the Essenes in Egypt. There are several books written by Jews that make Christ out to be an Essene. He was profoundly affected by the Egyptians because he spent his boyhood in Egypt. He was smuggled into a village called Marathia near Heliopolis. He spent his boyhood in Egypt. When you first see him in the Bible, when you first see him in the books by his disciples, they're first aware of him at the age of 12 when he's talking to the doctors. Egyptian doctors, what doctors do you think they are? And then he disappears. People put him all over the place, but we don't know for sure what he did before he went back. But it is said in the Bible, in Hosea, out of Egypt shall I call my son. He goes back now, out of Egypt, back into Palestine to conduct his ministry. Now many of us have become disillusioned with Christianity because we mix up the baby with the bad water. We think that because Christians have behaved in the most abominable manner as they have, that that has anything to do with Jesus the Christ. Or it has to do with the essential Christianity. Because some Muslims behave abominably, that that has to do with Muhammad. It has nothing to do with that. Once you embrace a religion, whether it be a political ideology or some sort of religious ideology, it's up to you. If you're narrow, you're going to kill people in the name of it. It has nothing to do with the essential golden strand in the religion or in the ideology. There's a far cry between Stalin and Gorbachev. It's the same communism they're talking about. There's a far cry between Muhammad and some of these people who call themselves Muslims. There's a far cry between Jesus the Christ and some of these people who call themselves Christians. So in the name of Jesus, practically enslaved half the world. What's Christian about Europe? Everything they did to Africans and people of African descent was unchristian. It is true that the image of Christ, that mar marvelous individual who could make his light shine, the individual beauty and power that could make his light shine against the overpowering darkness of the world. That was something that was to bring tremendous inspiration later on to many Europeans. But note, even, in the, in the, even at the time of the conversion, who do you think was the Pope? When Constantine, the Roman Emperor, was converted, the Pope, the Pope was a black man. You will see his picture in the slides. Miltiades, the black Pope of Rome. Or rather the black Christian Pope, because Rome later became the seat of the papacy. But the black Pope was a black man, Miltiades, 312 to 314 AD. All these things were carried into Europe. The basic idea, because the Africans very early, even going back to Tarsetti before Egypt, they saw Horus as a Christ figure. Their concept of the Christ was already there long before Jesus was born. You could see it on their temples. We saw that, and it's almost broken and shattered, but it was drawn for us by one of the Egyptian guides, showing the resurrection, showing the, the, the angel coming to, to announce the birth of the child, showing the virgin birth. All those ideas already on Egyptian temples at Luxor, long before Jesus the Christ appeared on the earth. Those ideas, those concepts were there. They were to profoundly affect the world. 
They're not European things. And when you look at, at the science, that in particular, it is amazing, not only the medicine, but look at the calendar, look at the mathematics. Geometry was developed by the Africans along the Nile. They had to deal with complex problems because of the fluctuations in the Nile. They developed geometry. The Greeks and Romans had arithmetic, but they didn't have geometry, that more complex kind of mathematics. That came out of the Nile Valley. And a range of other things. And the Greeks admitted it. They admitted it. Now Martin Bernal brings out his book, Black Athena. And because he's white, and I'm not saying because Martin Bernal is a very good friend of mine, but I'm just trying to show you the state of mind that exists in this country, that we were saying that, the op was saying that, and nobody was paying attention, but now a white scholar says it. It's a big thing. It's like a sudden discovery. It has validity. Black Athena shows you clearly how 200, 300 years ago it was accepted what the Greeks had said. These are black people of woolly hair and they gave us this and that and so and so forth. That was known as the ancient model. No, they changed it to the Aryan model. The Germans in particular trying to show that Egypt is a Semitic language or a so an Indo-Aryan elements and all sorts of things like that and how the Greeks exaggerated their debt to the Egyptians because even in spite of all their attempts to say that there was nothing black about the Egyptians they were at least aware there was some black in them it made them uncomfortable and therefore there was a long effort especially after slavery how can we as Christians enslave people who once taught us so much and telling us about how these inferior people and how we're giving them this and giving them that when if you really studied history objectively objectively you would find they gave us a great deal that couldn't be tolerated you couldn't sleep at night with a Christian conscience thinking that you had you were enslaving people who were equal in any real sense they had to be unequal. They had to be inferior. Therefore, they had to be excluded from everything that was of significance. Even when it was found in the heart of Africa, among African people, something could not be accepted. When they found the ruins of Monomotapa, everybody said it was an African kingdom. Everybody said this was an African center in southern Africa. It's 800 years old. But when they saw the building, and the marvelous conical tower and these guys putting together stone in a manner in which it was never put in put together in Europe well it couldn't be by Africans naturally not is the Portuguese built it is the Chinese built it is the Phoenicians built it is the Arabs built it not Africans wherever they found something if they found the sophisticated plant the cultivated plant somebody brought it when I was studying our African presence in North America, I was corresponding with the South African. Um, he didn't know I was, I was black, because my name Van Sertema, it sounds like a Boer name, it's a Dutch name. Okay, I, I was, uh, my, my ancestors were the slaves of the Dutch, because my country was once owned by the Dutch. So he thought I'm Boer like himself. I didn't say he's a Boer, he thought I'm, not much different <laughs> and so he's writing these things and I'm collecting this information because he found maize had entered Africa and he couldn't understand how it had entered and like like Leo Wiener he'd also claimed that blacks must have been in America before Columbus but it took me a long time to realize what these guys were really saying black were in America before Columbus but they were still slaves they hadn't jumped at all because what he was really saying when eventually he wrote me a letter in which he said Van Sertema if you find the Yam the Colocasia and the Negro all three of them West African items in America before Columbus someone a human being must have brought them there in other words, the blacks were in America because a human being 
a white person who could migrate and move, brought these static people into America. Could you understand that? Do you know how deep that is? That is the reason why we have such a hell of a time recovering history. I have students, I teach students in black civilizations. After a whole semester in which I've shown them of all these various methods we've used to reconstruct history, on the plane coming from New Orleans this morning, I'm reading an essay by one of my students in which she is telling me that uh, it's a pity we can we can never recover this history because we only have the old tradition, it's unreliable. And she's quoting all of these early white scholars and the books that she had bought at some expense from me, she wouldn't open the book. Could you understand that? She would not open the book. Now, now that's not true of many of my students, thank God. But could you imagine that? She has already made up her mind. I'm going to say we did great things, yes, because Van Sertma likes to say that. But I'm going to read the books that were read before, because I don't have validity. I'm black. So it doesn't matter what you say, she would not, and she doesn't even know it. She doesn't know that is what the process that is out. Can you understand the sickness? That is why we can't, we can't be casual about this. This is dead serious stuff. It's as serious as religion. And it is religion because it is making sacred again the human being. It is religious in that re regard because that blackout, it's a blackout, a whitewash. It is as if Europe has totally overpowered us so that, as I say, we become the invisible man in history. And the whole thing that come out to suggest that we are making it all up. Look at all these things. It's so, it's detailed, it's so detailed that the great thinker, the greatest scientist in Europe before Einstein, Isaac Newton, who brought about this tremendous synthesis of all the sciences at, his, at that point in time. Do you know what he was doing? Now, he is a genius, I'm not denying that, but even he was cheating. They found a book written on various elements of gravity, written by a moor. And he had written all, it of course is an obscure little book, because there was no great print impresses at the time. He's written his, uh, um, Isaac Newton, his book. And he has a lot of writing on it and discussions to himself and so forth. When he died, they found it among his papers. Nobody said anything. Recently, a man in England has brought it to light. Now, Newton was a remarkable man, though. And Newton, to the astonishment of everyone, including myself, studied Egyptology. Newton said, we thought he got his Egyptian education from Kepler, Copernicus, and Galileo. Galileo had used an African water clock in his experiment, and he had been affected by Egypt. But we found that he was actually reading Egyptian texts, and he said, there are three things in which some of my work has been prefigured. One, the Egyptians knew about the atom. Of course, it didn't reach the point about atomic fission and fusion. That is a recent development. But they, he said that they called the atom the monad, and they saw it as the building block of the physical universe, even though they had mystical notions about it. Nobody on earth even dreamt about the atom at that point in time. Not until many centuries late. He said further, he was convinced, that they had a sense of gravitational attraction because they talked about the harmony of the spheres, how these things were held in a certain relationship because of these belts of gravitation. Pythagoras came from Egypt with that theory. He'd been there, according to Newton, 22 years. I thought it was seven. This is his own brother, scientist. 22 years he spent in Egypt. And then um, th he said that the Egyptians had a heliocentric theory of the solar system. That is, they knew that the sun was the center 
and the bodies revolved around the sun. That is why they were able to make such accurate calendars. Do you know in Europe they did not know that? It took a long time before in Europe even knew that the earth was not flat. And they had people, intelligent scholars in Europe telling you that you, if, the, if the earth was wrong you would fall off. And they would tell you that the, if the earth was wrong then there would be people in Australia walking upside down. That was a big concept for them. These are, you see, now we are living on the European power where the European media overwhelms us and all the books are European so that we automatically assume having been born in that prison, that mental prison, we automatically assume these people were on top of the world with all their tremendous intelligence and invention. That is not the case. And it doesn't just end with Egypt. There were other movements by Africans into Europe. Africans were not a static people. Not only had they been there migrating in the very first period, three African types migrated until finally the modern type, the African Come these, the, the movement, even when the Egyptians are defeated, their ideas, and sciences enter Europe. And then come all the movements. We found Taharqa, the Sudanese pharaoh. When I was reading about the Mohammedan dynasties, I found to my astonishment that in the Spanish history it was mentioned how a black pharaoh, Taharqa, they called him, who was both a head of the army and later became a, a king of Egypt and Nubia, how he came in with a garrison into Spain. And they found cartouches, the signature of some of these kings, from the Shishongs to the Osorkans that are found in Spain, and some Egyptian influences and some Spanish villages. And then came Hannibal, that's another invasion. Hannibal, and for a long time, although there are many books on Hannibal, they just said, well, he couldn't possibly be African. But I want to draw your attention to a very important essay in that book, Great Black Leaders. There's an essay on Hannibal that is very important, and there you will see for the first time the actual photograph of Hannibal as found in a coin. Now, there are many of these coins, okay, and all of them have Africoid faces on them, but this one is a special one. This is clearly Hannibal because on the other side of the coin is the elephant Surus. This is the elephant, the only elephant that Hannibal rode. And there's an inscription telling you it is Surus. And the whole, all the battles that were involved bringing the Africans and other people, mercenary armies across the Alps, and the final battle against the Romans is all described in that essay. For ten years, Hannibal held power over a great part of Europe. But when his brother... As Drubal tried to bring up reinforcements from Africa, he was murdered and the Carthaginians lost hope and, and um, Hannibal was abandoned and he committed suicide. But very significant was the eventual movement in Europe by the Moors. And I want to say a lot about the Moors. The Moors that there again greatly misunderstood who were the Moors. The Moors are a mix of people. In the Sahara, there were people known as the Garamantes. These are indigenous black people. However, there came in some fair-skinned Libyans. They're both black Libyans and fair-skinned Libyans. These people came in and they were known as the Tawny Moors. Okay, the white Moors or the Tawny Moors, but they're, the vast majority were black Moors, the Caramantes. Then, um, at first, the Arabian Peninsula was peopled strictly by blacks. Then came another group coming in, and by the time of Muhammad, the blacks were a minority in Arabia. So you have an Arabian type that comes into play. You have two types. 
of in, in Arabia both a dark skin type and a fair skin type in the time of Muhammad. And in fact, it is the fair skin type that runs against Muhammad and pushes him into Ethiopia. Muhammad runs into Ethiopia just as Jesus went to Egypt. Both prophets go into the fastnesses of Africa when they were in trouble. And you find Muhammad retreated into Ethiopia, he and his disciples and eventually charged back again and conquered his enemies. After his death, the ideas that inspired him were to spread over the world. It was to spread over the world because many of the Mohammedans or Muslims came into various parts of the world and tried to convert people. They went into India, they attacked India, they went into, they went even as far up as into China, they went into Africa, they intermarried with Africans, and eventually the major part of the story occurs around 711 AD when an African general, Tariq, is sent out across the Straits of Gibraltar with 7,000 troops. 6,700 of them are black Africans, 300 are other types, probably fair-skinned Arabian types. I use the word Arabian versus the word Arab because anyone can be an Arab, anyone speaking Arabic. They move up into Spain, they conquer Spain. Now, you, if you go to Spain, you're going to find the same problem that you find with the Egyptians. They don't want to hear anything about the Moors. They don't want to hear anything about the Moors because the Moors, as far as they were concerned, they don't seem to understand. They don't want to go and check out what actually these guys brought into them. They don't want to hear anything about it. Yet all of our pictures of these Moors are drawn by the Spanish because the Muslims forbade the creation of images. So when there's the surrender of the Moors, it's drawn by the Spanish. Black generals surrendering. Now, if they weren't in charge and they were not the Moors, how are they surrendering? It's like if the Russians come here and we're supposed to surrender. Who do, who do you think is going to do the surrendering? Could we surrender this country to them? I mean, it's so absurd. I mean, when you see these black faces, it's amazing. It's like this book I read when I was studying the Moors. I read this book by this English woman. A big book. For 300 pages, the Moors are fair-skinned with straight noses and blue eyes. Then things go bad and the Moors are being pushed back. And one stage is a big battle and then you suddenly the sentence, tremendous slaughter of the Africans. Where the hell did they come from? <laughs> I mean, I mean, not a pause, you know, no flutter of the eyelid. Now the thing is going down, everybody is black. You find it in, in England too, you find it when you go into the museums. As soon as they reach the point where the Sudanese pharaoh, they have period of decline, period of decline. Okay, it's going to the dogs, it's going to the blacks. <laughs> and there, there is no, I mean, I'm telling you, this thing has become so, uh, it's become a reflect. They don't even realize there's anything. I, like, I remember I had a, when I was in Guyana, I, I, my boss, um, one of my bosses um, was uh, in charge of a certain section of information services. And then when I went to st in information services in England, um, there was this Englishman coming down the steps and says, I hear you from Guyana. I said, yes. He said, uh, um, Jusa, your boss, um, marvelous fellow, isn't he? I said, yes said, jolly nigger, isn't he? He didn't think, he, he didn't, he, he was jolly nigger. What he's mean to say, isn't he a marvelous chap? He's always laughing, as niggers do. He didn't see anything wrong in that, jolly nigger. And he's telling me that, you know, and, and, uh, and I said to him, perhaps he appeared so. <laughs> because I can't say anything else because I'd lose my job. So, I mean, these curious reflexes were to reshape history. It is amazing how many things were pushed under the rug. 
You cannot imagine and a book. That's the next book I must write. Because you cannot imagine what an impact the Moors had on Europe. Greece and Rome, their glory had long faded. Egypt, Europe had fallen into great sleep. Europe was so backward, so backward that a disease had struck and killed half the people. It was worse than AIDS. They had no protection. They had they, many, they, they were, public baths were unknown, unknown in Europe. Disease spread like flies. It was unbelievable the low level of Europe. There was not a lighted street in Europe. There was not a paved street in Europe. The kings in Europe lived in barns. Then came the Muslims. They set up these fantastic mosques. Unbelievable things. If you see them, some of them today, they're absolutely unbelievable. They've introduced public baths unknown in Europe. Public baths. They introduced public libraries. There were private libraries in Europe for the elite who read and wrote, the few who read and wrote. There were no public libraries for the people. Europe had two universities. The Muslims introduced 17 17 universities into Europe. Everything that could be found in the outer world, everything that could be brought in where the Moors had their courts in Morocco and in Europe was brought into the universities. Everything was translated into Arabic, which, by the way, was invented by Abul Aswan, an African. It's in the diaries of Ibn Khalikan because that script was created at the time when Arabia was largely black. It was not largely black at the time of Muhammad. And there were major figures in the Muslim. The right-hand man of Muhammad was a black man, Bilal. Some people claim Muhammad was black. I don't think he was. Because he wouldn't have found it necessary to tell the Arabs they are to respect blacks. They are to treat them as equals. He also said the same thing about women. Okay, so that he wouldn't have found it necessary to make those edicts if he was black. I wouldn't say that some of his family were, he didn't have family in his extended family who were black. Well, he himself, we cannot establish that he was black. But his right-hand man, Bilal, was black. And many of his, many of the major figures at this time are black figures. That thrust into Europe brought four dynasties, and the last two dynasties were actually created on the Senegal River. The Almoravid and the Almohade dynasty, those were overwhelmingly African dynasties. The first dynasty, the Umayyad dynasty, had major African elements. The Abbasid dynasty didn't last at all. It lasted six years when the fights which have been going on up to the day, the Sunnis and the Shiites practically killing each other. After the Umayyads established a dynasty, the Africans and Arabs established a dynasty. The royal family was holidaying in Damascus, and the Shiites killed 76 members of the royal family and seized power. And then the Umayyads retreated, Abdurrahman retreated back into Africa, brought a great African force back and smashed the Abbasids with renewed power. And he insisted that everybody should live in harmony, that they should not take spite against the, that Christian Jews and Moors should have equal rights. He also um, insisted that one thing he did insist, he did not, and this is one thing people say, well, okay, but you invaded Europe too, so what are you talking about us invading you? Well, we, the Moors, of which we are a critical part, did not destroy the legal system of Spain and Portugal, did not destroy their churches, did not destroy their language, did not destroy their humanity. So that is not the same thing. Invasion is something everybody expands and invades, but not it's not natural to treat people like dogs, like chattel. That was very special. Even in the Romans, 
when they had slaves, they had laws governing the slaves, far more sophisticated than the laws governing Negroes, quote unquote. So it's not the same thing. That claim cannot be made. That cannot be thrown in our faces. And the things they brought in, everything that could be translated, out of China they brought gunpowder, out of India they brought the numbers. Europe did not have numbers. It had a number system, but it did not have ciphers. The Romans, more advanced even than the Greeks, had, had letters for numbers. One is one, two is one one, three is one one one, four is one V. V is a, a letter. Five is V. Six is V1, seven V11, one, one, eight V111. One, one, one. That's how they counted laboriously. The early Africans, the Egyptians had ciphers. Greece did not. Rome did not. And who do you think brought the ciphers we're using today into Europe? Not Europeans. Europeans didn't invent 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. Some people claim it came out of India. And recently, about a year ago, someone brought to my attention that at Saqqara, there's a stone in the step pyramid of Saqqara which carries the shape of these numbers and that in Hotep, at the time of in Hotep, these ciphers are listed alongside of the common ciphers, but we have no dead proof of that. I have sent that wrong to six black mathematicians and no one has yet replied. It is possible one day we will be able to solve it, but one thing is quite clear, it is not European. So comes things from all over the world, the compass, the astrola, the ciphers, the calendar, all of these things coming from, and then you're going to hear about how we did it all. We made the world. You see, these are the little people who were backward and did not have a brain like ours, did not have as many convolutions in their brain. Even scripts, which we take for granted how Europe became so literate. Europe was 99% illiterate the time the Moors attacked in 711 AD. So was the rest of the world. Small cliques everywhere read and wrote. The large amount of people did not. With it was the Muslims who made education important. They made it necessary at a certain level. You had to have education. And guess what they introduced? The Africans and Arabs coming out of Morocco and other parts of Africa and Arabia brought into Europe a whole lot of things. Air conditioning for the first time bringing water on the ground pipes, bringing water from the mountains for the first time, baths, public baths for the first time, and bringing so many things, all the great fruits of the world, strawberries and lemons and dates and all of those things introduced into Europe for the first time, the silk industry introduced to Europe by, for the first time. The rice industry introduced into Europe for the first time. And all the things like us today, for example, in sophisticated Japan, the best cameras, the best radios, the best cars, etc. It's so frightening. But at that time, the best things in the world were where the blacks and the Arabs were. The tanneries of Morocco, the sashes of Almeria. The carpets of Tulala, the, the steel of Damascus, all where the Moors had their centers, that is where the best things were. They introduced optics. The first eyeglasses in the world were made by the Moors. The first experiments with the camera, although it was not yet perfected, was made by the Moors. And we never hear anything about that. They wrote long agricultural treatises. All these things were introduced. The first lighted streets in Europe, the first paved streets in Europe were made by the Moors. And all this in 1492 came to a brutal end. It came to an end before. It came to an end around 1230 AD when the Moors started to retreat until they were left with one place, Granada. 
And in 1492, the same year Columbus sailed for the Caribbean, came the forces of the Spanish, defeating the rest of the Moors who had been split by battles between the Sunnis and the Shiites. They were weakened. The slave trade had weakened, um, had already begun to affect other parts of Africa. And then eventually, you find the fall of the Moors in 1492. And that fall was a tremendous fall because it was to change so many things. And the most important thing it was to change was the attitude of the world towards people of African descent. Because there was a deliberate attempt to destroy everything, to destroy even the memory of that time. In 1492, Cardinal Ximenez ordered everything to be burnt. That was Arabic. 84,000 manuscripts at the time when the printing press had not been invented. And when a manuscript, there could be no more than two or three of a manuscript. All that was burnt. Deliberate destruction, just as in America, there were three massive burnings of books. And so we look back to that period and people could come and tell us, but what did you do? What did Europe do? As I said to Congress on July the 7th of last year, these ships of Columbus, not one instrument in those ships was European. The sails were Arab Latin sails, which Arabs and Africans were using in other oceans. The compass did not come out of Europe. The Astrolab did not come out of Europe. They did not even know how to plot latitude and longitude. Columbus struck out for the latitude of Japan, hoping to land in India. And he himself says it. He says, I have eight or nine pilots aboard the ships, and they are like blind men. My pilots are so ignorant, I am afraid that they will not find again the lands I have discovered. Unquote. This is Columbus himself talking very honestly about the level, the sophisticated technological level they had reached. And their ships, those were no big ships, were vast ships that were put on the ocean, the Chinese report, ships from Africa, two centuries before Columbus, coming with elephants. Can't take elephants to China in a dugout. <laughs> And as I said, and it's very important that among the tapes that you get, you should get a copy of the tape on Van Sertima before Congress, because then you hear the whole story. You hear all the voices in the chamber, etc., because I did embarrass them. Because the chairman, <laughs> the chairman of the Oversea Congressional Committee, which is looking at the work of the Christopher Columbus Quincentenary Commission, and they're going to have this big hullabaloo belay in 1992. But they're not going to get away scot-free, because we're going to have our hullabaloo belay in 1992 as well. But they asked them, do you have any blacks on your commission? No. Any Native Americans? No. So how could it be an American celebration? Who are you celebrating? So now let me close because I have to show the slides and we're running out of time. I've been in another state yesterday and the day before and I'm in another state tomorrow and I'm marking papers and going into my class and so I'm really rather tired. But I want to close by saying that the story of the African presence in Europe is one of the most unusual stories. It is very, very central and pivotal and it is central and pivotal because of the fact that Europe has dominated us for the last five centuries and has brought us to a point where even though we've gone beyond slavery, naked, brutal slavery, there is a slave master walking about in our heads. We have become our own slave masters. We have that policeman walking about in our heads. And we have a situation now where even though the facts are coming out, it's as if there's a resurrection of facts. We are still in that state of death, that state of sleep, 
in which we have been for centuries. And let us therefore remember, this is the one thing that struck me tremendously, was that towards the beginning of this century, there was a tongue in the West Indies. I can't remember where at the moment, but there was a volcanic explosion. And only one man, only one man survived. He was a prisoner. He survived, Mang Pele, thank you. He survived because he was slightly on the ground. He survived because he was half away from the disaster on the surface. That is the black. And that is the message of this century. That when the volcano erupts, that blows away this crust of lives, let it be that whatever else happens, that magic, that beauty, that power that exists within us, imprisoned though it is now, will be the thing that will survive. Thank you very much. Okay, hold up on the lights for one second. We need to set up. Okay. Probably. Now, there are many sculptures found in the caves of Europe about 55,000 years ago. This is one of them, um, which um, deals with a certain kind of figure with very high hips and very big buttocks and a certain structure of face, etc., which is found all over Europe in that time and in parts of southern Africa. This is um, going back, of course, about... Uh, about 55,000 years ago. Next. We're coming now to deal with marks left by Africans in the civilizations of Europe. It seemed that not all the blacks disappeared. This is a black in Britain. This, you see the crown. This is in, in the royal annals of early Britain. When Britain was attacked by the Romans, it was recorded that in some places the people were black as Ethiopians and they could not understand that so that in certain parts of of Europe the black figure did not entirely disappear in the population you have for example in in um, in some instances like in Ireland you have a battle between black sea rovers um, the Fomorians with the fur birds and therefore and you have the capture of Tory Island a big section of Ireland by by Africans Okay, this is in Britain next. There you find, this is in the Royal Annals of Britain. The, the figure with the peculiar, this peculiar hair, very unlike the, the Anglo-Saxon hair. It features, etc., and, and crowns, etc. Next. This is a black knight being married to um, an Anglo-Saxon lady. This is also from British history. 
Next. This is in um, in northern Europe now. This is among the Vikings. Next. This is one of the Danish warriors. Next. This is the Swedish warrior. I should mention that they found very tall, powerful blacks among the Vikings. The Vikings are white, but you have major black figures among the Vikings. Thorstein the Hunter um, and um, Thorhal. These are powerful black figures that appear among the Vikings. And Gorman, the king of Ireland, one of the kings of Ireland was black. Next. This is in Crete now, which had a profound influence, Minoan Crete, which had a profound influence on, on Greece, um, apart from Egypt, um, and Schleiman and Evans, who excavated Crete, found that, came to the conclusion that this was an African civilization, or largely African civilization. Here you see, this goes back more than 3,000 years. You could see the drawings of, of, of blacks next. This is the war party. This is the navigation scene. Once again, look at the ships. This is more than 3,000 years ago. Look at the curve of the ships. Look at the people who are in the vessels, not just the rowers, but in the main, ves the main vessel where the chief is. These are all blacks. Next. This is the stag hunt with the blacks again. Next. This is the army, captain of the Cretans, black. Next. This is a priest, Pylos, in Crete, black. This is to have a profound influence on Greek civilization, not just the, as I say, not just the Egyptian. Next. This is the god Beth, with African type features. Next. This is Isis, and suckling Horus. This was to be the prototype of the Black Madonna, which was to be found all across Europe. Even the Roman Emperor Caligula, that lunatic, had a shrine to Isis. Next. This is Isis again, arms outstretched. Next. This is the Black Diana. This is found in Europe. Next. This is these, here again. You see the black um, Madonna faces changing now. We are the faces becoming a little more European, but the black thing is retained next. And the idea here one very striking. This is in Spain. This is the black Madonna and child. These served as images of Mary and Jesus for many centuries until the time of Michelangelo. Next. This is the black Pope. Pope Miltiades. This is a portrait done more than a thousand years ago. It's been removed from the church. The Vatican probably has it, the original. This is 311 to 314 AD. This is the time during which Constantine was converted. Next. There are 25 saints in the Roman church which are black. This is one of the most famous Saint Maurice. This was the patron saint of Germany and Austria until the time of Hitler when he was removed. Next. Here is Saint Maurice, very famous saint of the Roman Catholic Church. Next. This is Saint Benedict the Moor. Next. These are now one or two blacks who became very famous and boasted about their black blood, mixed blood, Alexander Dumas and Alexander Dumas Pierre became a very famous swordsman and 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 um, lover in, and writer in France. Next, this is a black community found in Russia. Russians do not understand how they got there. Okay, that was found about 50 years ago. Um, next. This is a um, boy who was um, adopted by the Russians, the Tsar of Russia, Peter the Great, who adopted a black boy and, in, and kept him in his court. He, he came to be known as Petrovich Hannibal. It's not to be confused with Hannibal the warrior. Um, this is Petrovich Hannibal. 
he became um, he was put he was made um, general in chief of some of the Russian forces he was also appointed head of the International Commission by the Russians to um, negotiate the treaty between Sweden and Russia a border dispute between Sweden and Russia he also was an, an um, engineer he was tutor in mathematics to the crown prince of Russia and also he um, was responsible um, for uh, a major section of Russia because um, Tsarina Elizabeth um, put him in charge of a, of, of a great section of, of the peasantry. So he was greatly respected. He is the maternal grandfather of Pushkin. Next. This is Pushkin who boasted about his black ancestry. Um, he became the most famous poet in Russia. He transformed. The reason why he became so important is because he started to write for the people. The Russian language was only used by um, it, the, as a literary language. The Russian language was used by many people, but as a literary language, it was not used a lot. French was used. It was, it was disrespected by a lot of the Russians until Pushkin wrote, and Pushkin made the language come alive so that he became very famous. Um, he, however, started to write for the people, causing disturbances so that the Tsar threatened him. He, he, he persisted and uh, he was banished and then they felt sorry for him and he was brought back from banishment but after that he was told not to write again and he became a playboy and started running about the place um, with a lot of women eventually he married a woman who had a love affair with a Russian officer and pushed challenge him to a duel and he was stabbed in the stomach and he died but the um, the Russians were so afraid of, because of his popularity, that um, uh, students were forbidden to, to cut classes on the day that Pushkin died. But for many days afterward, thousands of Russians filed past his bear. Next. Here's the Black Diana. Black Venus, sorry, Black Venus. Next. There was a great fascination with the black woman, so many of the painters drew naked black women. And black women became to represent the, the most sensual woman in the world. And as a result of that, many of the noble men and kings desired black women. And there were lots of affairs between kings and black women. This is particularly true of the French kings and the Portuguese kings. It's also true of the Italian noblemen. Um, you find, for example, the Medici as well as the Gonzagas, the two most powerful and richest families in Europe, they both had black women and as a result of um, this you have um, the next slide you have the Duke of Florence he, he was the son of a Pope the liaison between a Pope Pope Clement VIII who was Cardinal de Medici and his mistress producing um, the Duke of Florence um, who was put in charge of a great part of Italy next this is the black nun of Moray this is a result of a liaison between Queen Therese of France and a black man in her court called Nabo uh, she had been very jealous because her husband Louis the 14th was having an affair with a black woman and despite him she had an affair with Nabo in court and when this black child was born the king of France said to his doctors how could I give birth to a black child the doctor said you see that black man in your court Nabo it is possible that while your wife was pregnant he looked at her <laughs> and, the, and the child turned black and the king said it must have been a very penetrating look <laughs> anyway this led to scandal and she was smuggled into monastery where they visited her for the rest of her life. They did not allow her to live in the palace. The Duke of Chartres fell in love with her but could not get permission from King Louis XIV to marry her. So she was taken back to the monastery where she died. She's known as the Black Nun of Moray. Next. These are figures from the coins. Unfortunately, we haven't yet got the, except in the book, Great black leaders we haven't got the coin of Hannibal but these are figures who served in the great Carthaginian army on the Hannibal 
um, when they defeated the Romans. Next. Next. This shows you the centers in Africa during the Middle Ages where um, learning began. It's not like the North Africa of today, which has been overwhelmed by a certain type. This was a very, very indigenously African, as they say, the Garamantes, indigenous black Africans, and people coming in from Arabia to try and bring about the Muslim conversion. Next. This is one of the um, chiefs of the uh, one of the Moorish sections of the army. Next. Where is of the veil? This is from the Senegal River. Next. This is the, was the Prime Minister of Sicily because the Moors did not just enter Spain and Portugal, they also entered Sicily. This is Joannes Maurus, who was the Prime Minister of Sicily. Next. This is, you can see clearly now, here the enemy representing these types, so you can see very clearly their faces. These are, this is in the heart of Europe. This is in the heart of Europe now. This is about the 10th century, more than a thousand years ago, black coming through Europe. He's clearing the way um, as the black dignitaries enter into the, the street. Next. Uh, uh, we have a problem there. You've gone back instead of forward. Yeah, okay. Now this, this is... is um, this is the circumcision ritual, again, held in the heart of Spain, where the blacks are having a big festival um, in the heart of their dominions in Spain. Next. These are black noblemen playing chess in 12th century Spain. Here they are. Okay. Next. This, this is a black in Morocco. This is um, probably a painting, but this is more recent. Next. Now, this is a very important document. Many Europeans had taken for granted after the slave trade that Africa was an empty wilderness, that they didn't have any great cities, etc. Leo Africanus wrote a book on the geography and history of Africa, a very famous book. Only a few people read it because not many people read it at that time. But he drew maps showing how deeply studied with towns and cities was Africa before it broke up. It's a very important document. The man who read this book is Shakespeare. Shakespeare was extremely liberal for his time. Shakespeare, in fact, had a great love, a um, woman called Lucy Negro of Clerkenwell, to whom he wrote an ode. Shakespeare also read very closely about Africa from Leo Africanus and actual sentences from Leo Africanus appear in Shakespeare's Othello describing the nobility of many of the blacks in this area. Now, the story of Othello came from an actual happening and, and here I want to close by showing you the people who were involved in that happening. Next. This is a white man in Italian a nobleman, very rich nobleman, the Gonzaga, from the Gonzaga's family. Okay, next. This is the black woman he married. This is in the ceilings of his, of his palace. This is his daughter. Next. And this is his son. This is Othello. He married a white woman whom he murdered on Christmas Day because he suspected she was having an affair with a lover. And a novel was written about it by a man called Cincio. And it is that novel that came into Shakespeare's hands and Shakespeare wrote the story of Othello. Okay, next. That's it for tonight, folks. Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Come on, let's give him another warm round of applause. He was snapping pictures all over the place and taking all kind of photos. And uh, he took a very important picture, a very nice picture. And uh, it's something that we want to bestow on a special person. Um, we're going to ask Sister Karen Daughtry.